Hey, Aplayas, I'm so lucky to be here with Dr. Warren Farrell. Let me give you guys a quick overview about Warren Farrell here. Warren Farrell is a New York Times bestseller and considered one of the world's top 100 thought leaders by the Financial Times. He's also a pioneer in the men's movement and the women's movement and has appeared in over a thousand TV shows being interviewed by some of the biggest names out there. His most recent book, The Boy Crisis, takes a deep dive into the research as to why boys are struggling today and what we can do about it. Warren, I'm so grateful and happy to have you here on my channel. Hi, thank you for the service you're doing, reaching out to adolescents when who are usually at their most insecure period of finding out who they are in the world and um, and trying to, to navigate that, especially if they don't have dads. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I've been reading more into your book and stuff, and I just, I think that, you know, in the book, it seems like you break down, uh, in the boy crisis, you break down kind of, there's four uh, main groups uh, that essentially kind of boys struggle with or, or where the boy crisis comes into play. Um, and I wanted to kind of, I had a few questions to kind of dive into those topics. So I'd love mm -hmm. to get your expertise on that. Um, one of the first things I wanted to kind of talk about is, you know, many boys today kind of struggle with school, uh, whether it's paying attention in class, whether it's feeling like um, school is rewarding for them, feeling like it's hard for them to maybe reach out for assistance if they need help. And, mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to just kind of get your your advice on that. You know, what do you think boys can do or what do you think boys need to make it easier for them to succeed academically? Well, I think the, the most important single tool that I think any boy or girl can have really is the tool of listening and hearing what um, people say, uh, making sure the person who's speaking feels heard. Almost every human being as the other person is speaking is is not really fully listening. They're what I call self-listening. They're listening to themselves create a response to what the other person says, but without realizing that it, you know if you really want people to be attracted to you and find uh, the space that you hold comfortable for them, um, just hear what they're saying and share with them what you heard them say. Uh, that is so soothe. So few people really feel heard, and people who do feel heard by you um, sort of really just like that leaves them in a place that is far more uh, soothing, comfortable, and desire. They, they become desirous of sort of being with you to a greater degree uh, than than um, than any other single thing. Now, with uh, with girls and girls and boys and boys, that is especially true. Um, if you're a guy who's interested in being with a girl, uh, most girls sort of see that, um, you know, they, they sort of see guys become very nervous and the more uh, attra attracted you are to the girl, um, the more nervous you become. And so oftentimes you do that, but you um, become, you start talking about yourself. And again, she, the most important th thing is that, that you can do is to hear what she says and say, so what I hear you saying is, is, is this, is that accurate? And ask her, is that accurate? And if she says, um, no, uh, well, sort of, but you know, um, I was really trying to say that, um, most guys will go ahead and start saying, trying to figure out a defense to say, no, no, I really was saying that. But instead, it's really more helpful to just say so uh, and to correct yourself and to and to uh, and to correct yourself in regard to making sure she does feel that you have heard her exactly very very well. And when a woman feels that she's being heard well, she you're empowering her. She feels good around you. She feels heard around you. Very few people hear other people very well. Now, having said that. Once you hear her well, uh, then sharing a little bit about what makes you um, active, involved, effective in the world. Uh, do you play basketball? Do you? Uh, what are you involved with? Do you love doing, um, you know, math? Um, are you good at you on the math team? Are you on? Um, you an actor? Um, do you have a passion? She wants to hear your passion. Because people, because women don't fall in love with men who um, are um, living in their parents' basement and uh, dropping out of school and don't have motivation. Um, uh, women consciously and unconsciously look for men who are performers, who are um, who can do well. But if you start out talking about your performance. Um, the the woman is going to be seeing the insecurity that that's coming from, and that insecurity will have uh, an impact on her that will make her want to withdraw from you, rather than the um, you being secure enough 
to draw her out. And then after you do that, uh, sharing a little bit about yourself or at least leaving some space for her to ask you questions about you. Yeah, and I think that's that's so powerful. Um, kind of finding commonalities and then showing a person that you're just genuinely interested in them as a person. I think a lot of times, like you said, we just uh, enter a conversation just wanting to fill the fill the gap in the empty space with just speaking because maybe we don't know how to listen uh, as well, um, yeah. and we're so used to kind of just filling awkwardness with just by speaking over the silence there. Yes. And you don't, at the beginning, need to um, blame yourself if you're not genuinely interested. Genuine interest comes from knowing someone and that connection feeling like, oh, I'm really seeing um, some complexity to this person. I'm seeing some nuance. And that's what builds genuine interest. So the beginning stages of inquiry and then sharing and then sharing what you heard the person say that's what creates the foundation for genuine interest to emerge. Yeah, I think that's that's so incredibly true. Something that I think that a lot of young guys uh, struggle with too, and just staying on that topic there, is um, there's a lot of maybe pessimism or self-doubt. Um, you know, mm -hmm. they believe, why would this person care about me? I'm not interesting enough. I bring nothing to the table. I mean, I think there's two parts to that. One part is how do you kind of get over that hump of self-doubt? And then also, how do you build a level of confidence in yourself so that you do feel like, hey, I bring something valuable to the table? Yes, and so the, the only person, the person you're meeting, this woman or another guy you're meeting, um, cares about at the point of meeting is themselves. And so your, your victory, so to speak, in connecting with them comes from asking them about themselves and hearing what who they are in a way that is better than other guys than um, he or who they are. Uh, so while other guys are sort of um, are showing their um, their plumage and dancing around, and the women are sort of like laughing and interested, you know that you're that they're interested. Remember, at the beginning, they don't care about you. It's only unless they've seen you on the football t team and so on, or you know, seen seen you as a celebrity in the in the school, um, they're they're not likely to be caring about you at first. But the, what is always guaranteed is that the person speaking, whether male, female, trans, uh, they care about themselves. And when they see you, not just ask the questions about themselves, but share with them what you heard them say, that's when they feel oh. When I'm around this person, whether it's conscious or unconscious, I'm feeling seen, I'm feeling heard. That's the magic. Um, and rather, and again, rather than dis, rather than correcting them, rather than saying you got it right when they maybe do correct you or add something or modify something, working on getting it until they say, "Wow, yeah, you can feel that they feel understood." Never say to someone, "I understand." I understand is really a substitute for shut up. I've heard enough. Um, but tell them what you understand until they tell you, wow, yes, you can see in their eyes that they feel understood. Yeah, and, and I, I'd be curious to, to hear, like, I'll give an example. Let's say um, you're talking to someone and they say, hey, I had a really bad day at school. I failed the test. My parents are upset with me. Mm -hmm. And they share that with you. What do you think would be a good response to let them know that you kind of acknowledge and hear what they're saying? That is really a bummer. Um, you must feel terrible about that. Just stop there. Mm -hmm. And then that opens the door for them to say a bit, say more. The invitation for the person who's sharing grief with you to say more is more, much more important than you telling a story about how you had a similar circumstance. Because at the beginning, the person who's sharing the grief wants more space to go deeper. And when you share your um, grief, you, you will think about that as empathy. Mm -hmm. But that empathy is a good second step about your sharing something that, but the first step is give, give never underestimate the need for someone else to feel valued by your creating the space for them to go deeper. Uh, the big mistake is moving the conversation away from them to you too quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then when, when you do 
give, say, an example, yes, like I had the same type of experience and you elaborate on that experience, make sure it goes back to them again. Uh, don't use your stories to pull over to you. And if the if the woman or man that you're talking to um, feel it, it, it picks up on your story and asks you to elaborate more, remember again, if the original grief, the original hurt, the original pain came from them, make sure it goes back to them. All these things will register unconsciously, um, meaning that you know the, the person may not walk away and say, um, you know, Billy or whatever did this um, to, with me, um, but she or he will feel like, you know, when I'm around him, I really feel, or her, I really feel sort of seen, yeah. and that's what you want. Now, you, now in the Boy Crisis book, um, a couple of important things to tap into. Most people not only don't feel seen by the people they meet, but they feel even less seen by their parents, uh, which is ironic because you know almost all parents their their desire is to to understand and you know be empathetic to their children and they you know their their entire life is focused on making sure you're as um, that your life is as good as possible. Um, so it's really you know weird for a parent to hear that, um, but you know for the most part when you're at a dinner table and you're sharing something that you're maybe happened that's difficult in school or, you know, somebody you didn't get along with, what you immediately, you know, or you, you suggest that maybe, you know, um, there's some new re research on psilocybin that say that those, you know, that they're really um, healthy for you and your parents hear drugs, psilocybin, oh yeah. my God, danger. And you see that, that you know, they're no, they're no longer listening to you. They're figuring out how to tell you to get off of, you know, to, to who are you hanging out with? And uh, mm -hmm. why, you know, why are you saying that? And where did you get that information from? And all you see all this doubt uh, in their eyes and you see them ready to um, uh, tell, a, tell an alternative story, to lecture you, to put you down uh, and so on. So um, I really encourage you to read the portion of the boy crisis that talks about how to set up family dinner nights uh, without them becoming family dinner nightmares. And you know, one of the core ways of doing that um, is to um, make sure your parents and you all know, but if you show your parents this, they'll, they'll know the structure to do this. They know how to create a safe space for each person at the family dinner table to speak up about their experience without being interrupted. And when they do speak up about their experience, the job of the other people, well, at least one or two other people at the table, your sister, your brother, or your father, or your mother, to say, um, you know, so what I heard you saying, Billy, is this, um, and you, and then for your father or mother to have the, um, to, to not assume that they heard correctly, but to give you space to be able to say, well, actually, you know, mom or dad, I meant this, not that. And for your mom and dad to be able to say, oh, okay, so you meant this, and then share what they feel mm -hmm. that you said, until you say to them, they have, they've got it right. And then to be able to ask you, is there anything that, that, you, that they missed in sharing what you said? And then to invite you to add more if you need to. And you'll only be willing to add more when, they, when they've gotten what you've said up to that point um, correctly. And then once that happens, once your parents do that for you, um, it's also important for you to do that for your parents mm -hmm. and for you to do that for your brother and your sister. And when this type of skill set is practiced a couple of nights a week at, at family dinner nights that are structured in this way, you know, most family dinners, you'll get together and you'll do whatever, whatever in a non-structured way. Um, but your parents, when they read the section on um, how to set up a family dinner night without become, it becoming a family dinner nightmare, uh, they will see the value of, of that. And one of the ways to determine whether or not your family can use that in a helpful way is if you find yourself talking more at, in an at-ease way with a guy friend or a woman friend than you do with your parents, that's a sign uh, that your family um, can benefit um, from knowing how to hear each other rather than knowing how to interrupt each other, lecture each other, have a better idea than the other one, and, and compete with each other. That then closes the family down. Uh, the, the goal of all families is, should be, but almost never it almost never works out this way, the goal of all families is to make sure that each person feels comfortable and secure telling their truth 
without being interrupted, lectured, um, or redirected before they feel heard. When, mm -hmm. your, when your parents speak, then it's their turn to make, and maybe they will offer advice and maybe they will redirect. Then it's your turn to hear them without interrupting and arguing with them, but just letting them know that you're hearing what they say. Yeah, yeah, that's, and I think that's so true that, you know, I think we don't recognize that our families um, also present that opportunity for us to practice and work on our social skills, work on our empathy, to work on our social listening, uh, and building that with talking to your mom or your dad or your siblings, um, you know, will also, I think, I think make it easier for you to now approach people outside to make new friends because you're fostering that behavior in the home and you're fostering those skills. So then it becomes easier to replicate them outside. I think Absolutely. one of the challenges, though, is that um, some pe some people, I think, struggle with having deep, uh, loving relationships with their families. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe there are toxic elements in the family. Uh, maybe there's a missing father or a missing mother or, you know, there's just fractured um, elements in there. Maybe um, someone, you know, someone's in jail or, or some other element that kind of makes it mm -hmm. difficult for them to form that deeper connection. Um from your advice, what should what should young people in that position do where they feel like, hey, connecting with my family just not a realistic option for me. So where else can I go? Who else can I turn to to kind of work on these skills? Yes. First, connecting with the people in your family who are present is a realistic option. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, then really spend time with the communication sections of the Boy Crisis book. Um, but having said that, um, there's a lot of other options too. Let's say you're a, a guy and you, your dad was involved for a year or two, but you know your ma mom and dad got divorced, or your mom had a, um, had, had children without being married and raised you, but basically by yourself. Maybe she lived with a man, uh, the, your father, for a couple of years, and then they broke up, and you, you're not you've r rarely seen him. So in brief, you don't have a real solid, steady male role model. Um, then work on making sure that you do a number of things. Uh, one is that you get involved in sports. And when I say you get involved in sports, I mean three types of, of what I call in the Boy Crisis book, the liberal arts of sports. The liberal arts of sports of sports is the most important single one is team sports. The, the second most important one is pick up team sports. Go to a basketball, um, go to your schoolyard and pick up a basketball game uh, from kids you don't know. Um, because the, um, set, set the rules with the kids. Uh, you're going to play half court or full court. Um, and the pickup team sports teaches you how to be an entrepreneur, how to create your own rules, how to create your own boundaries, how to, how to enforce them, which ones to enforce, which ones not to enforce, um, and how to, how to compromise without the supervision of somebody else telling you what to do. So you have to create your own um, outcomes and your own parameters. Uh, that's why pickup team sports is so helpful and so important. Um, and then, and then so sports that require you to be, you're on a team, but they require largely a lot of self-discipline, like um, gymnastics. You're on a team, you contribute to a team, but it's largely your skills. You have to practice them over and over again to develop the skills that you will perform um, on, you know, on those bars uh, by yourself or tennis or golf or um, you know, bowling, where again, you're part of a team, but the primary effort is your discipline and your contribution. All three of those sports, the ones that require the self, the, the, the ones that I just described require self-discipline, that's so important, self-starting. Um, team sports are perfect preparation for um, preparing yourself to be a good family member, to be a good uh, corporate leader. Uh, getting along with other people is even, you know, once you know about as much as the average person, most of the rest of your um, success at something comes from your social skills, your emotional mm -hmm. skills, and uh, the ability of people, the people around you to feel comfortable. Um, and, um, and, then, and then the pickup team sports, as I said. So that's what I call the liberal arts of team sports. If you're good at one, 
make make sure you get involved with ones that you are not inherently good at. Um, I was a, a gifted runner and kicker when I was younger, um, but as a result of the running and kicking being uh, good, I had very um, short, my ligaments had gotten very tight and my muscles had gotten very tight. So I was terrible at things like yoga. I do, um, uh, before the COVID, <laughs> I did yoga almost every day um, because um, it was exactly what I was bad at. Um, and so work, take, take things that you're bad at and work at them. Um, and 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 develop a skill set in in uh, that are in areas that are outside of your comfort zone. So those are a few things. And number two, get yourself involved if you're at the appropriate age with either Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts. Um, the the most important single part of your own development is not know making sure that you you got the algebra test um, aced out or the um, you know cal calculus test aced out. Um, in the long run calculus skills are going to be far less important uh, than emotional development skills. So m make sure you you uh, work on those um, in your life and, and character development because people will notice, pick up, and care about your character. So there's solid evidence now that boys who uh, join Cub Scouts and girls who join girls um, um, Brownies, they are, and especially Cub Scouts, if they're likely to be involved in Cub, if you're involved in Cub Scouts consistently for two years or longer, um, very good studies show that you're much um, more likely um, to develop um, a very positive character. And this is these are studies which, which with control groups that are very carefully done. Um, so character development, you we all want that. Uh, Cub Scouts are really good. Boy Scouts are de uh, in the Boy Crisis book. I take a part, I deconstruct Boy Scouts and tell you exactly why the very best aspects of masculinity are developed through Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts, the Boy Scout leaders that I've talked to, they are themselves astonished that Boy Scouts are created in such a, uh, have evolved in such a positive way over the years. Um, if you're into, if your family is into faith um, and you sort of like, you know, um, sort of like, oh, ah, you know, probably God's fiction or whatever. Um, you may be doubtful even about the faith, but get involved in a faith-based community, um, especially if the faith-based leader um, is getting together, you together with other boys your own age, uh, because spe uh, be and, and, and to make sure that it's really clearly understood that the sh sharing that you do with other boys is confidential. Uh, because um, if it's not confidential, then you'll fear sharing what, you, what you're really feeling. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that the insecurities you feel, the anxieties you have, the times that you've bragged or bullied or uh, exaggerated and things like that, that every other boy has these same experiences and the same feelings. And you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll walk around, your body language will begin to change. You'll walk around with a type of internal security uh, that uh, others will be attracted to, um, both other males and also females. Um, and so those are just a few of the things I talk about in the Boy Crisis book, that if you don't have male role models um, to make sure that you get, um, uh, you, you, because remember, as you go from age nine to your 20s, here's the type of thing that happens. At age nine, if you're a guy, um, you, uh, the, uh, a, a boy and girl who are age nine almost never commit suicide. And when they do, they commit it, they commit it about equally. But between the ages of 10 and 14, boys commit suicide twice as often as girls. Between the ages of 15 and 19, boys commit suicide four times more frequently than girls. Yeah. Between the ages of 20 and 25, boys commit suicide five times as often as girls do. In other words, from as, as your testosterone develops, you will be, um, and, and your social environment does not give you encouragement to talk about your fears and your feelings. You will keep your fears and your feelings to yourself, and they will become like a volcano inside of you. And uh, testosterone plus pent up feelings um, creates a lot of a temptation to act out, uh, to bully, to brag, um, and but also is like are likely to make you depressed. And mm -hmm. um, but because guys have much less permission to talk about being depressed than girls do, 
Um, and when we talk about it with other guys, the other guys are likely to sort of listen for a few seconds and then toss it off and say, well, let's play right. some all together or let's do something else. Mm -hmm. But the underlying feelings, you don't feel heard by them. So it's so crucial uh, for you to, um, to, to, to be involved with other boys your age who are, who are in a confidential group sharing the feelings and fears that they have so you don't feel alone and isolated um, in, in, that, um, in that setting. Yeah, and, and that's so true. I mean, <clears throat> a few of the things you mentioned, like for myself, I grew up, I was in Boy Scouts, and I feel like mm -hmm. those, that was such a formative period for me. Um, mm -hmm. I learned how to work with others, and when, when, the, when there was confrontations, um, there was kind of this, I think, leadership that stepped in and helped us resolve those issues together as a team. Um, yeah. And then even for myself, um, me and my friends have always been involved in kind of like backyard wrestling and wrestling in the parks and just having this kind of team sport element. And I feel like that was so crucial for my, for my own growth in learning to work well with others and feeling a sense of um, kind of um, personal uh, autonomy and kind of, you know, sharing with others and having this kind of physical play and fun along with kind of developing friendships and being open with these people and being able to share those things. So that Absolutely. overlap there I felt was so crucial for my development. And I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I think it's so important. One of the mm -hmm. things you mentioned I, I wanted to kind of dive deeper into was you, you mentioned kind of um, exploring kind of the more the positive elements of, uh, of masculinity there. And that um, sometimes in, in, let's say, all male environments, there is this kind of like um, um, lack of desire to always like sit and listen and open up. Um, do you feel like like there are um, maybe uh, along with the positive, like negative elements um, in environments that are primarily boys that we should try to um, work on or, or call out or address in some kind of way? Yeah, I think a wonderful thing to do is to um, usually in these type of faith based communities and when when you are in with a group who is where it's safe to say what your feelings are, your fears are. If you're feeling like, you know, sometimes maybe you're a, you're a boy and you are mostly heterosexual, but you found yourself attracted to another boy, um, say, or you, you know, you're with, you're with a girl and you didn't get hard right away because you were really nervous, um, you know, and these are things that, you know, most guys won't touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, but when you see, when you do touch into it and it's confidential, then you discover that, oh, three of the guys in the, you know, this room had that same feeling. Um, and that maybe they didn't even say it for a while because after you said it, uh, they, um, they felt like still embarrassed to, to say some version of that. But, and they may not say something like that, but they may, it gives them permission to say something different that they felt badly about. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel really, you know, my penis is too small and I don't really want to um, be exposed or I'm too thin or I have, you know, I have, yes, I have broad shoulders. So I always let my shoulders show, but I have really thin legs or vice versa, you know, or, you know, my nose feels really, you know, awkward or uh, whatever. Everyone has insecurities. So you're talking about yours opens up space for other boys to do that. And remember, this is much harder for boys to do than girls because boys, the way we got girls uh, was to, to be the alpha male um, and to, to share any uh, girls don't fall in love uh, with boys who complain. Um, boys who complain they see as whining males um, and they fall in love with alpha males, not whining males. And so, but the result of that is we unbecome people. We don't, we're not valued for being human beings who have full ranges of feelings. And then we're blamed for having toxic masculinity uh, because we repress our feelings. So we're caught between a rock and a hard place. If we express our feelings and our feelings include things that we're worried about or feel insecure about, that looks really bad to, to other boys. Other boys might talk to other boys about it and make you know make hay, hay out of that. And, um, and so we learn to really shut up about it. Or we mention it to a girl and the girl feels like, oh, God, you know, um, you know, I don't want to be involved with him. He's really insecure. Mm -hmm. But in fact, um, you're secure enough to 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 know that those things are um, uh, are can can be shared. And so the same type of thing is in confronting the culture. If you're hearing um, if you're hearing people say, um, you know, the future is female. Well, how do you feel about that? If you're hearing people say um, we, um, males have male privilege, how do you feel about that? Well, talk it through with people that it's, it's safe to talk it through. You'll find that there's um, a lot of possibilities. But then when you get involved with a girl, um, and make sure that um, 
you are open enough to talk with her about that. Will you lose some um, girls? Absolutely. Um, and uh, and count that as a blessing uh, that you know the girl you lose is somebody that can't hear who you are, mm-hmm. have the strength to be who you are, um, and you will absolutely lose some people in the process, and therefore you you will have uh, you will not have an opportunity cost lost. That is, you'll be able to focus your life. Um, on people who can hear who you are, rather than trying to convince people who can hear you uh, who you are that you're worthy of their attention. I think that's yeah, that's that's so powerful. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, I, I've come across different organizations online that are aiming to also help young men and boys. Um, it, are there any kind of uh, organizations or practices that you know that that young young boys who let's say are um, feeling left out or feeling abandoned uh, within society. Like you had mentioned, kind of um, even hearing a phrase like the future is female may interpret that as like, well, does that mean males are not important? Does that mean I'm not important? Do you think mm-hmm. that there are any, any uh, good organizations out there that are helping boys kind of um, work through those feelings or kind of are giving good advice or, or you know, mentorship in any kind of way? Yes. Um, there's a, a, a group called Boys to Men um, that is nationwide and is really good at this type of thing. Um, Boys to Men encourages you to have mentors, mm-hmm. um, and um, and that's very important. And there's two things that are important on the mentorship area. Uh, one is, uh, especially if you don't have a dad at home, um, the, what, what I found when I did the research for the boy crisis is that boys who go from female-only homes to elementary schools where there's almost all female-only teachers, they have no positive re- male role models in their life. And so their testosterone tends to get... Um, channeled destructively rather than constructively. Mm -hmm. So for example, almost all your mass shooters are dad deprived boys. Um, And especially your mass school shooters that kill a lot of people um, that are so angry that they plan their school shooting so effectively as to kill 10 or more people. Every boy in that category in the 21st century has been a dad deprived boy. Mm -hmm. Um, Your ISIS recruits are dad deprived boys. Um, and the smaller percentage of girls that are ISIS recruits are dad-deprived girls. Um, and so if you, if you don't have a dad at home, you're finding a mentor is very important. Boys to Men is a very good organization. There are many groups like Young Men's Ultimate Weekend that give you, give you experiences um, here in California, um, but there are groups all throughout the country, the Mankind Project, MKP, just Google Google that, or in the, in the, and in the Boy Crisis book, I have a whole series of organizations and resources that you know, boys can go to uh, for, for um, really uh, good uh, role models. But the important thing is that most of these organizations still only know of the value of finding yourself a mentor. But you need to know that there's even more value in finding yourself someone that you can mentor. Because when you're helping a boy out um, and you start taking responsibility, you, 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 wanna, you want to be able to direct him well. And him for him to, and to direct him well, he has to honor you and respect you. But in order to honor and respect you, if you're taking drugs and therefore not focused on com- completing work at school, or you tell him, you know, I'm going to be on the basketball team, but then you don't practice a lot, and so you fail to be on the basketball team, you know you're not going to be as good a role model for him as if you uh, practice and practice and practice. You get on the basketball team, you invite him to a game, and then um, he sees you play in that game and do well in that game. You know, he, you, or, you know or acting or musician or whatever your skill set is. Uh, then he's going to, you understand implicitly uh, that he will pay more attention to you Mm -hmm. and you, and you will feel good because you're, you know, you're helping him more and he can look up to you and see a real role model that doesn't say one thing and do another. And so boys are helped more, even more. So find somebody to mentor you, but also find somebody to mentor. Boys make more progress by having someone they're helping um, than than they do even by having somebody that helps them, even though both are important. 
Yeah, and that's something that that's something I'm 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 personally even aiming to do. Um, even with my YouTube channel here, um, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of it is me sharing my experiences, talking about things I've gone through, sharing advice, and a lot of the young people that have watched me have watched me for years, so they've gone through their formative development years with me, and now they're going off into college and things like that, and they're older. And what I'm really trying to foster is kind of like. If I've helped you, then, um, you know, like maybe there's something you can do to help someone else in your life, a younger person in your life that is going through things that you went through, you know, so just trying to pass yeah. that along. I think that's, yeah, I think you nailed it on the head there. There's so much value in um, being a, a positive role model who really lives your values for a person that that is looking up to you, you know, because I think Absolutely. a lot of times a lot of us, um, you know, um, let's say you're a parent or let's say you're a father, you know, like you mentioned, it, it's so important to really live the values that you want your children to really, uh, you know, hold up and, and maintain. Um, but if you're not doing that yourself, then you're not really setting that positive direction. Absolutely. And I very much agree with what you're saying. So here's an example. So say you're feeling lonely and you don't have a, you know, a good male role model. Um, so you watch Josh Speaks, you join the Boy Scouts, um, you, uh, or you join the Cub Scouts. You notice a few other boys that you really like and feel comfortable with. And so you know, to invite them over and watch an episode of Josh Speaks. That'll be, uh, that will trigger some conversation afterwards. If the ones, the boys you feel comfortable talking with afterwards, invite them into a group that meets once a week or once every couple of weeks, ideally once a week. Um, I've started 300 men's groups, so I do know the ones that do the best are um, are um, once meet once a week. Uh, make sure that everything you say in that group is confidential, and that any boy, every boy knows that any that anything that is used against you out of that group, or even spoken of positively that was in the group, um, that, that that is the, the end of that boy's involvement in the group. Um, that, that, that that's the one that no, uh, no, no. Um, get involved in the group in such a way that everybody in that group has uh, about an equal amount of time to speak. The two most important considerations for um, uh, getting a successful group of peers together is that everything is confidential and that uh, that nobody dominates the group and that and and we have uh, opportunities today that we never had when i was growing up which is to be able to see something like josh speaks to stimulate a conversation um and when i when i grew up there was no such thing as zoom the internet or whatever and and so nobody could see that anybody out there was doing anything constructive um toward bo- uh, helping boys to open up remember uh, we, we hear liberals say about this toxic masculinity liberals are right there is toxic masculinity but that but we often hear uh, liberals say that's a result of male privilege there they're wrong toxic masculinity did not come from male privilege it came from male sacrifice having to sacrifice yourself at war in every generation meant that in order to be disposable at war, which is what it required, a male to be a male, uh, was required to prepare himself to be disposable um, in each generation's war. And to be disposable, you had to keep your feelings to yourself. Who, If you were disposable, who cared about the way you, uh, feelings that you had? You were being prepared to be part of a war machine. The war machine works best when there are no squeaky wheels. And if you're, if you're, uh, let's say, Jewish, and you're the sergeant in boot camp says something anti-Semitic, and you speak up and say, "Gee, that sounded anti-Semitic to me," uh, the job of that um, of that boot camp sergeant was to was to make sure that he insulted you and mocked you enough that you got the message that your feelings did not matter. That is, you unbecame a human being because they needed you there as a human doing. Now that created toxicities in you, but that toxicity was not from male privilege. That toxicity was from male, uh, the expectation of males to be disposable and sacrifice themselves. So, um, so you, your heritage as a male is to prepare yourself to be disposable. But I, but for the first time in human history. Uh, we have per- much more social permission for males not just to train themselves to be human doings who are disposable, but to be human beings 
who have a full um, breadth of feelings. So don't object to claims of males having toxicity, um, but do um, object to them coming from male privilege, but also recognize that females also have female toxicity um, um, and, 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 and males and females have a great deal of positive things to contribute to each other that do evolve from the history of their gender. And there should be plenty of permission for somebody to be transgender, but just not pre pressure for them to be transgender when they're younger um, before they've uh, developed their mind fully. And remember that we boys, we males, don't have a fully developed um, brain until we're in our mid-20s. So don't make crucial decisions about your life um, a bit before you're in your mid-20s. Mm. And yeah, interesting point there. Um, really just kind of, we'll wrap it up here, um, but I just wanted to ask more about the toxic masculinity. And I think that, I think with any kind of um, toxic element of something, whether it's toxic masculinity, toxic positivity, I think it's like, as you said, it's, it's this dismissal of acknowledging kind of the, the value of the individual, right? So yes. um, it's, you know, like the, the, t the toxic framework is think this way, act this way, do this thing. And anything that you feel that differs from it, we're either not going to acknowledge it, we're going to downplay it, or we're going to mock it in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, like you said, it, it, it exists for males and exists for females. It exists, I think, for everyone all around. And, you know, to some degree, I think some people really gravitate towards um, upholding those structures of like, no, this is the way it's supposed to be. And mm -hmm. people form a sense of identity around it, too. I think a lot of young men do form a sense of identity because maybe the, the, the role models or the heroes, what they see on TV or even who they see uh, in their schools or in their home still carry kind of that um, old world um, ideas of like, you're a man, don't cry, don't be weak, don't do mm -hmm. this, you know? Um, so, you know, how, how can a person who I think is struggling with understanding what's right, what's wrong, how can they kind of approach those conversations in a way where they can get, get more clarity on it? Yeah, uh, one is to you know, read about these issues, whether it's the Boy Crisis book or and to talk about these issues. Secondly, is to make sure that you're petition your school and ask for your parents' help to petition your school to get to make sure that there are equal, if we, we're in an era where we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity. Well, take a look at your school's elementary school, junior high school. Are there equal numbers of male teachers? Um, are the male teachers all males like me, who I'm sort of more of a, um, a, a nurturer, connector type of male? Or are they also males who are more traditional? Maybe a working class male who's been a construction worker for a number of years, got his you know bachelor's degree for, in teaching. Um, are they are they traditional males with traditional values as well as liberal males with liberal values? And um, are they you know yes are they males of different um, colors? But are they also um, just plain males of different values? And are their values being heard in the school? Or do they feel they have to keep them to themselves? Um, and so. Um, so having male role models that you can um, look up to, no matter what your own propensities are, um, are really important. Um, making sure that not every school teacher is an atheist and not every school teacher is a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that, that, so that there's different people you can look up to with different perspectives. And most importantly, begin to work with your school and making sure that everything, it's safe to hear everything. If, you're, if your teacher has, a pers has an ideology, and that ideology um, prevents other people from speaking up safely without being put down or without being ignored. Uh, and then being ignored is even worse than being put down. Um, is uh, That is really um, so important. If it's not happening, talk with other people who you sense agree with you. Um, get together a group, get together a group with their parents and confront your school. If we need more male teachers in my elementary school and um, it, or talk, uh, your parents will probably um, hear that and say, oh yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we can get, make that happen. Um, so that the next time that they hire, it is not just a person of color or a person, um, but it's also a person of your gender that you can feel more understood by, especially if we're, you're without a same sex role model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So really just creating a more, I guess, diverse environment of thought, of experience, of values will allow mm -hmm. you to kind of assess and learn and, and kind of decide for yourself like what feels right. And But that's in having that wider knowledge of it, essentially. Yes. And make sure that 
that you model in your school and among your peers, um, listening as well as talking. Um, it, as you develop thinking skills, you'll sort of begin to de develop, say, you're more politically left or right, or you're more religious in this way, or atheist or whatever, and just listen to all of those that have different perspectives rather than feeling you need to argue with them, correct them, and make them into, into uh, miniature versions of you. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I think that's so true. And that's that also really aligns with everything I'm trying to promote on my channel as well. And thank you for kind of for myself reiterating it so that I know, okay, that's, you know, I'm in the right direction there. And hopefully yeah. to anyone watching that, you know, rewatch this, I'm going to add timestamps so you guys can jump through each piece and really, really hone in and listen to the advice of Dr. Farrell here. Dr. Farrell, thank you so much for jumping on and sharing your advice, talking about the boy crisis and kind of just walking us through kind of the steps on how to be more open, how to be more um, more mindful in your experiences, and how to really kind of develop a, a life for yourself that I think will help you kind of figure out how to navigate uh, navigate the world a lot clearer. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. And if I may say one thing here, I realize one of the things that it's very important in the boy crisis to read is the chapter that talks about the differences between dad-style parenting and mom-style parenting, because that will teach you what you need to, why you are so needed as a father. Uh, fathers do so many things that are different than mothers, like a roughhousing and um, it's, it's changing, exchange, teasing, exchanging wit covered put downs, um, getting, letting their children take more risks and so on. And most fathers don't know how to explain that to mothers. Most boys don't know how to explain that to the girls that they're dating. And so it's so important for you to be fully involved, to be, to, to know your skill sets and your biological propensities and the value of them. Almost no boy is able, who becomes a father is able to say, um, you know, I want a rough house with the kids because it teaches them how to be more empathetic. Though that sounds so counterintuitive. Understand why that is in fact the case. Um, and so you can share with, a, with your future uh, wife um, the, the value of that. And the woman you're dating can see, you're a guy who really thinks about these things, who wants to be the best parent possible. That's the type of guy I want to have in my life for the long run. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's incredibly true. I mean, yeah. If I may say the last thing, just um, by the way, a lot of people um, do not like to read. Uh, so if you're, if you, to, to take a listen to the audible version of The Boy Crisis, don't feel you have to do the reading of the book itself. Uh, that'll give you both the, the, the words, but also I hope my voice will be able to communicate it and um, communicate it to you maybe with a little bit more tonality. Awesome. Thank you again, Dr. Farrell, for jumping on the channel. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation. Hopefully we can talk again in the future. I look forward to that. I really uh, thank you for the work you're doing, creating a, creating a next generation that's even more productive and uh, making a contribution that, to those who haven't even been born yet. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.